Well, Jay, you're back again. Now I've replaced Josh, continuing to talk about Exorcist films. I'm so glad Halloween is your favorite holiday. I wish there was a Star Trek holiday so I could force all my fucking friends to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> but I thought we are talking about this movie because you like this movie. I love this movie, yeah. Well, Mike, Josh, and I talked about The Exorcist, the Academy Award-winning film from 1973. On Best of the Worst a couple years ago, we watched Exorcist 2, The Heretic. Yes, we did. Now we're at Exorcist 3, a.k.a. Legion, which I don't know what I discovered that you liked this film, but I was kind of surprised because it doesn't seem like it's really your thing. This is one of my favorite horror films of all time. That's great. I think after Exorcist 2... The Heretic, a.k.a. Pazuzu. I am Pazuzu. A.k.a. Uh, fever Dream nightmare movie that everybody hated. Yeah. I was possessed by a demon. Oh, it's okay. He's gone. I think they all wrote off a third Exorcist film as like, uh, you know, it yeah. almost becomes a joke at that point, like Jaws 3. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's like Jaws uh, 4, the revenge. Yeah, yeah. It's the like shark a, goes right. after revenge. Although based on a novel by William Peter Blatty, and he was also the director. Yep. And a, adapted screenplay writer. Yeah. It was, and it, it very much uh, seems like a movie directed by a writer. Th there is, there is, um, Dialogue that doesn't seem to fit exactly. Um, it is really good dialogue. Some of it's great dialogue. The yeah. the banter between uh, George C. Scott and Father Dyer. Yeah. Uh, it's well, that's the the heart of the movie. Is, and the, is there friendship? There you go, blaming God. Who should I blame? Phil Rizzuto. You wouldn't want to live forever. Yes, I would. No, you wouldn't. You get bored. I have hobbies. Right? Brother Eddie had these same stupid symptoms for years. Your brother Eddie died at the age of 30. So what? He got killed in Vietnam. There could have been some connection. And then, of course, all the scenes with Brad Dorif. This is probably my favorite performance by oh, him in yeah, anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he's, his, his rants, so many great rants in this. Yeah. Uh, and they're so weird. A decapitated head can continue to see for approximately 20 seconds. I always hold it up so that it can see its body. And he, and he savors every word. He yeah. doesn't rush through it. it. It really, all those scenes in that cell, like it just holds on it. And, mm -hmm. and you're just like captivated. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's that one part where he gets, he gets like violently angry. The Gemini is dead. No, I am not. I'm alive. I go on. I breathe. Look at me. It's, it's such a great performance because he's playing a demon, something that's been around for thousands of years. So there is no rush. You know, like you said, he savors every word. Yeah. He's, he's just like, he's just, just soaking in evil. Yeah. And, it, and it's just a really great performance. It's a shame he didn't win an MTV Movie Award. Did those exist at the time? Yeah. 1990? That was okay. the first year. Oh. Best portrayal of a demon, <laughs> Brad Dourif, Jim Carrey in The Mask, <laughs> and the winner is Jim Carrey in The Mask. He is inside with us. He will never get away. His pain won't end. He's excellent. Yes. As the Joker <laughs> uh, meets Buffalo Bill. Yeah. Meets a, a, a legion of demons. And that is the title of the film, Exorcist Three yeah. Legion. Well, that, that was the title of the novel. Uh, it was shot, the movie was shot as Legion. Yes. And then, bafflingly, the studio said, let's capitalize on the Exorcist name, even though the Exorcist brand is a joke now, and the sequel was laughed out of the theaters. Let's call it Exorcist Three. And that's that's a, a was a point of contention with William Peter Blatty, and there were reshoots, and I'm sure we'll get into all that. But, yes, we will. Uh, but the majority of, of the movie was his original vision. It's very close to the novel. Mm -hmm. A certain matter of an exorcism, I think, in which your friend Father Karras expels certain parties from the body of a child. Certain parties were not pleased. 
to say the least. Well, the idea, and it's slightly confusing because of the reshoots and the, the reworking of the story, but in the theatrical version of the movie, um, there is this, this uh, person that's been comatose for 15 years, started to kind of come back to life and get very violent, so they've locked him in this, this room, this cell. And uh, Kinderman, played by George C. Scott, is investigating these murders that are similar to uh, the Gemini killings that happened 15 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Goes into the room, sees that, oh my God, this is the body of Father Karras, my friend who died during the exorcism in the original Exorcist film, who has now had the spirit of this Gemini killer just kind of slipped into his body. Uh, and so, yeah, whether it started with the Gemini killer who was possessed by a demon and it moved on, it, 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 is, it is moving its way, making its way around, and it can possess people remotely. Yes, uh, comatose people are comatose very easy to possess. Yes, they're the, they're the elderly comatose. <laughs> uh, uh, so we wind up in a mental hospital, yes. a regular hospital with a psych ward uh, attached to it, and there's lots of, lots of very scary elderly women <laughs> in this film. Stuff that, that borders on comical, maybe goes over into comical Never. for some people. It worked completely for me in the context of the story. Um, but what I like about it is that, it, like the original Exorcist, it's very kind of grounded and real. It almost feels like a documentary, and it's essentially a family drama. It's about this mother and her daughter, uh, and them dealing with that. And this one's like a like a cop procedural that then sort of has like an occult horror film snuck into it. Yeah, uh, George C. Scott is wonderful as the, the hard-nosed detective who's, who's on the verge of cracking. He's so frustrated with everyone that he works with. He's just constantly angry. Well, he's, he's um, I mean, he's old and he's super desensitized, yeah. but it, uh, he still shows his frustration many times. What if not us who? And if not now, when? We're fine! It is not in the file! It is not! You you shut your mouth! Yeah, it's, it's interesting that uh, William Peter Blatty, who wrote all these stories and directed this movie, uh, he was concerned about some of the things that were cut from the original Exorcist film that William Friedkin cut, that uh, he was concerned that by cutting these things it would make the movie seem darker or it would make it seem like evil wins. Some of them maybe had a different interpretation of that. That's always bothered you. I've always rejoiced in it, frankly. I don't want him to think the devil won. But this movie feels so much darker to me. And this movie is about a man just having to accept the fact that the world is horrible and there's so much awful, evil things that we do to each other. I, I noticed, I mean, this is probably the fifth time I've seen this movie. I think I might have seen The Exorcist twice. I saw it when they re-released it in the theaters. Where everybody laughed. Everybody laughed. So disheartening. A friend to me. of mine, I went with some friends, and one friend said, You guys haven't seen this? Like, I said, I've seen it. And they're like, Other people haven't. And they're, You're going to be so fucking scared. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, uh, well, that's, every, everyone was laughing, and he was like, Yeah. Like mad. And jo Josh um, and I talked about that, how the movie's sort of a victim of its own reputation. Because for the yeah. longest time, people kept calling it the scariest movie ever made. It was in 1974. Yeah, or or but whatever. you re released that in 2000 when there's movies like 13 Ghosts. <laughs> Like that's where horror films are. It's not going to play to that audience as well. But uh, the, my point is that Exorcist Three would hold up to today's audience. I think so. Yeah. I love this movie because um, because the main character, the only character in the film, is George C. Scott, <laughs> a supremely disturbed and angry man. Yes. Yes. He's very angry. Yeah. And he's very, like, sad. Mm -hmm. And his best friend in the world is killed in the most horrific way possible. After he, he it, uh, an early scene in the film, he, he's investigating a murder, and it's a murder of a little black boy who is, like, uh, in the police boys club, and they knew him or something like that. And it's down by the docks, and he, and he lifts up the, the white sheet, and he's like, oh, We God. don't see what he looks at, which is a recurring thing throughout the movie. We never see any of the horror. It, it, it's very cold um, and, and clinical and um, institutional. It's not a human story, it's not humanity. Even though it's about good versus evil, 
it, in a strange way, that's, I think that's why I like it. Because it's so like cold and clinical. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's about institutions. It's the police, the church, and, and medicine. It's yeah. three big like things that you're supposed to trust in and, and, ha and work all by, by um, a set of procedures, mm -hmm. basically. And then you have this wild card, this demon that's just breaking all the rules. Right. And George C. Scott is trying to understand it. And so are the police and so are the doctors and nobody can. Yeah. And it's whether it's like what you put your faith in. And, or you can't have faith in anything. And because, it's being challenged. Yeah, because there are no answers. I love the scene early on with Kinderman and Dyer at the restaurant mm. with, a, with a two second cameo by Larry King for some reason. Did you notice that? No. There's lots of like uh, observational shots in the movie. I'm sure you noticed that. Oh, it shows like a sink and a, that's, a picture. That's and all that. what I wanted to mention as well. Yeah. And when they introduce that restaurant, there, yeah, there's a couple shots of the restaurant and then there's just showing Larry King at a table. Oh. Yeah. He doesn't have a line, he's just there. We're gonna live forever, Bill. We're spirits. Oh, I would love to believe that. But that scene is uh, uh, Father Dyer talking about how it'll all work out at the end of time. Uh, you know, you gotta put your put your faith in, in that things will work out, not in this life, but the afterlife. And then Kinderman just just in great detail explains how that small boy was mm. killed. Killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes and cut off his head. The place of his head was the head from a statue of Christ, all done up in blackface, like a minstrel show, you know? And then they cut to Father Dyer's reaction, and it's like his whole like view of the world is crumbling, and he's trying to keep yeah. it together when faced with that reality. And they, after they have ironically seen It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, yes. Well, that, that's something that connects the movie to the original is, yeah, Kinderman and, and Die are going to the movies together, and they've continued to do that over the years. It has my favorite monologue, maybe in any movie ever, where George C. Scott is talking about the carp. My wife's mother is visiting father. And Tuesday night she's cooking as a carp. It's a tasty fish. I, I have nothing against it. For three days it's been swimming up and down in my bathtub. Up and down. And I hate it. That, that's, I, I think that was actually in the original Exorcist novel. I think Kinderman talks about that, but then it wasn't in the original movie, so we ported it over to this. Uh, thankfully, it was used somewhere because it's so great. I can't go home until the carp is asleep. <laughs> because if I see it, I'll kill it. And it continues, even like the smallest things that are supposed to be uh, like, like a, a positive thing in life. My, my mother-in-law is in town, she's gonna prepare this meal, but he's just so frustrated and angry that there's this carp swimming around in his bathtub. Well, yeah, and it all culminates at the end, which is great. But uh, I think his character is just, yeah, he's bursting at the seams because he's seen so much yeah. of the awful side of humanity. And, um, and not just the murders. I mean, there's, I noticed too, there's a lot of like mentions of racism. You're a racist, Ryan. Did you know that? So uh, she says right out loud, these Jews are crazy. They are. They're all wackos. And there's, there's like five or six different mentions of it up front. It's like, it's like all this like seething evil in everyday life and people and, yeah. and and now he must face the ultimate evil, Pazuzu. <laughs> I mean, Pazuzu's friends. Pazuzu's friends, they are legion. legion. Yeah. Legion. Legion comes from the Bible. And Jesus said to the man who was possessed, what is your name? And he answered, legion, for we are many. We are. Other than the off-camera murders, the first scene we see is the creepiest fucking scene. It's the confessional scene. Oh, yeah. Again, we don't see the horror. We don't no. see what happens. We see before and we see after. We don't see any murders yeah. in this whole movie. It's A all, movie about a serial killer. It's yeah. all implied and it's all described. Mm -hmm. Guy cut her throat and watched her bleed. All this bleeding. <laughs> 
I just love this concept of this evil force. Yeah moving around. It's in there, it's in that confessional. Mm -hmm. We don't know what form it's in, but it starts talking and it starts saying the most disturbing things. <laughs> Well then, I think even before that scene ends, you start to hear a woman scream, and it's very off-putting because yeah. there's no woman in the scene, but then that leads into the right. the aftermath, which we transition, see. transition. Yeah. yeah. There's just like two little children just staring blankly, like all yeah. those cuts, yeah. all those those weird cuts that just really keep you on edge. Is that the scene when the, the church doors blow open, and then... Well, that's at the very beginning. The Christ eyes open. Oh, it's just like an intro, right? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. at the very beginning, which is worth mentioning because uh, we see the steps, the famous steps, the, the tubular bells music kicks in for like just a second and then this uh, horror droning sound uh, overpowers it. And it's like, I don't know, I always interpreted that as William Peter Blatty trying to say like, this isn't The Exorcists. This is a completely different movie now. The studio made me use this music. <laughs> I'm gonna use it for one second. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the, the cutaways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, it, it's this atmosphere, all those shots of the statues. And it's just, it's, it's, it's not just like, okay, here's establishing shots. You know, it's, it, there's something creepy about it. It makes it, it, it's moody and it also makes it feel more intimate. Mm -hmm. It's like, because it, it'll just randomly in the middle of a scene, it'll cut to, you know, a table or whatever. Uh, and then another thing that he does throughout the movie, when I mentioned the odd editing is, scenes will end very abruptly where it's like a character says oh, yeah. a line, cut to next scene, like immediately. Father Dyer's middle name was Kevin. Kevin. And it's like, it has like a psychological effect on you. Yeah, it's it's kind of unconventionally edited mm -hmm. and, uh, and directed too. Um, it, I don't know much about William Peter Blatty's direct history. He only directed one other movie before this, which I still haven't seen. I've been meaning to forever. It's called The Ninth Configuration. Because I like his direction a lot. I like the it, it, parts of it are more lighthearted than the original Exorcist. Like that dialogue, that snappy dialogue mm -hmm. between Dyer and Kinderman. Um, there, there's a few moments of levity and, and just odd supporting roles. There's like when Father Dyer's in the hospital and people keep coming into his room and mm. they think it's, it's like the wrong room. <laughs> Nice and peaceful here, isn't it? So, yeah, it gets a little uh, confusing on the man in the padded room, which originally was a brick wall room in, in the original shoots. Yes. And then the reshoots, it's a padded room, very similar with the two lights coming in, the great look of that it. That two shot, it feels like a stage play. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, really wonderful looking. Um, there's lots of scenes where uh, George C. Scott is talking to the Zodiac Killer um, who also inhabits many other souls, traps them like Freddy Krueger traps them, <laughs> except it's not depicted as a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> Sausage pizza, actually. The, the yeah. little meatballs. Oh, the little meatball heads, yeah. Oh, stop! This movie might have been more successful at the box office if it, if it had stuff like that in it. Yeah, um, it's, not, it's portrayed a little more um, uh, classy. Well, it's a continuation of the idea with the first Exorcist is the demon has not possessed Linda Blair just to fuck with Linda Blair. Uh, he's, he's done it because she's young and innocent and it affects everyone around her. It makes you question how could a god exist in a world where this is happening to this little girl. So that's what it's about, is affecting everyone around, which is why the, the conversations with George C. Scott are so great because he's seen the face of his uh, best friend who died 15 years ago. <laughs> It's the smiles that keep us going, don't you think? The audio work in this, the voice changing, the deepening in parts. And All the, the ambient noise too, yeah. so many scenes. There's not a lot of score. There's, it's mostly, everything is just played with this ambient noise underneath it. Yeah. Or complete silence, which leads into the scene that the movie is probably most famous for. Uh, the most uh, effective jump scare in movie history. Uh, yes, the hallway scene. We, we established the uh, the bone cutting shears. That scene, actually, the the whole tone of the movie reminds me a lot of Seven. Mm. It's like, a, like mm -hmm. it feels like a precursor to Seven, and that scene in particular where they're showing the yes. the shears to George C. Scott. Is it new? Just came in. Where's the old one? That that creepy, like I don't know, serial killer vibe. There's not a supernatural element to Seven, but just the tone of it and the fact that we don't see the killings, we always see the aftermath. Yeah. 
I always wondered if Seven was influenced by this movie. Maybe. Um, but yeah, the hallway scene, perfect example should be shown in film school. Well, again, it's odd though, because it goes on so long. We, we hold on that long wide shot for so long, yeah. and then we finally cut in. And then there's like a fake out jump scare with the man in the room. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to that long shot again for a really long time, and we're just waiting. And then it cuts into a close up of her at the desk. Yes. Like it keeps throwing That's you off. That's the only coverage, really. Yeah. It, then there's a switch out with the security guards mm -hmm. at some point. But you're the it camera. It lets you just sit there and yeah. you're like looking around, right. like what is supposed to be happening. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's let's stew. Mm -hmm. To the point where I think you kind of give up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're like if something's gonna happen, it would happen by now, right? And and then the, the cameraman with the the hair trigger on the snap zoom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And cut. <laughs> Again, we don't see anything. And it's it's perfectly effective. Yeah. As is as is the death of Father Dyer. Kinderman, what are you telling me? That great POV of everyone in the hospital, all the cops, all staring at the camera as George C. Scott approaches, yeah. not quite knowing how he's going to respond to this. Mm -hmm. Father Dyer had his had removed, uh, and all of the blood removed from his body. And put in little jars. And put in little jars perfectly but, without a single drop spilt. Yeah. Father Dyer's entire blood supply. Almost supernatural in nature, and the police are just standing there, <laughs> just fucking dumbfounded. Right. And, well, uh, and then again, we get a shot of George C. Scott pulling up the sheet to look at him, yeah. and we don't see the body. This movie could have been rated G. <laughs> Because we don't see anything, <laughs> and it works so well. But yeah, that, that whole sequence is so, again, with like the pacing of the editing, where everything is just, mm -hmm. and then It's a Wonderful Life is written on the wall in blood, and there's two L's, and that Double was a staple of the Gemini Killer. Yep, yep, yep. All, the, all these things that don't add up. And, and when, uh, we'll just call him the Gemini Killer. Sure. I want to say Pazuzu, just because <laughs> I want to say that word. You can't say Pazuzu. It might be Pazuzu. Uh, when he describes the killing. Off comes the head without spilling one single drop of blood. Now, I call that showmanship, Lieutenant. Um, and then they, they kind of determine that they don't have the same, the murder scenes don't have the same fingerprints. Mm -hmm. There's different fingerprints on everything. Yeah. And so, the, but they all show the signs of the Gemini killer. Like which the, was not known to the public. Which was not known which to the public. Which is another great George C. Scott acting scene where he yes. explains that all. Yes. Go ahead, Lieutenant. Temple, why are you encouraging you to shut your mouth? With this finger severed, the correct one, and the sign of the Gemini here. Here. And unfortunately, he, he gets a threat yeah. addressed to him from the Gemini killer. He says, go to the press. Which leads to the other greatest scene in the film. Back up, you son of a that was the climax of the original cut of the movie. Well, before they tacked yeah. on the exorcism. That was the big exciting ending is, yeah, George C. Scott racing into his house because he thinks his family's in danger. Some shots in that scene don't quite work for me. They come across comical when the shears almost go into his daughter's neck. Oh God, that's so creepy. I wanted you to see this. <laughs> but she's making the goofiest face. I, you know, I never noticed her face. Her daughter's like, ah. Like, yeah, because the grandma's pulling her head. Yeah, she's trying to pull her out of the way of it. Yeah. But. And another thing that was creepy too, again, we didn't even hear anything. Uh, George C. Scott's wife is on the phone talking to him. Uh-huh. That demon was talking on the phone. Yeah. In his voice. <laughs> as, we, we, as we've the seen, spine. yeah, as we've seen, the demon can do multiple voices. A regular it's, Rich Little, that demon. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's a reference uh, none of our audience will get. <laughs> he has shows in Vegas, you know. Yeah, he's got a residency. A residency. <laughs> Literally, he lives under the stage. <laughs> anyway, okay. Please help me. 
That grandma is so fucking creepy. Yeah. And it's great. It's, again though, like the fact that it's an elderly woman and it's so odd, everything about it is so weird yes. that it, it, I, I can see it coming across as comical to some people. Oh sure, I can see that. Uh, same with when Jersey Scott is walking around the psych ward yeah. and there's that wide shot and there's the, the one elderly woman running across the ceiling. Like, oh, yeah. it's so weird and unnatural that I can see it being funny if you're not in into the movie quite as much. Maybe that part, I, I see it as creepy. It's, it's like the, isn't there a, I don't think it's a cut scene when, when Reagan climbs up the stairs backwards. That, that was in the re-release version, yeah. Okay. She climbs, climbs down the stairs backwards, yeah. Okay. Like that scene where the woman crawling across the ceiling, it's just like harsh fluorescent lighting. Oh, sure. It's not, you know, creepy horror movie lighting. See, that's what, that's what I think works for me. Like we're talking about the, the old nurse, right? Mm. Um, the, the scene is, you know, clearly the demon has possessed this, this nurse. It's not even a nurse. It's a, it's a patient dressed up as a nurse. Right. The, the patient kills a younger nurse. Um, so uh, she's on the way and she has a bag and she's taking a taxi to his house. And it's just like, in the, and it's not like there's this, you know, moody lighting and it's at night even. Yeah. And I, I'm here to come in and help you with something. And yeah. You know, they don't, it's like, we don't even see her arrive. No, no well, Jersey Scott comes in and she's just sitting there. Yeah. 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 Oh, hi, Dad. Mother, Daddy's home. For a second, I think she looks over and she says, is it time to go to bed? Yeah. Please help me. It's like just a minute, her, yeah. her normal self came back. Right, or, or it was the demon pretending. Yeah, Oftentimes, demons pretend, mm -hmm. as I've learned from the show Ghost Adventures. Oh, oh okay. Demons often pretend to be uh, little children oh. to kind of lure you in. Come and play with us, Daddy, forever and ever and ever. You know, it's that kind of thing. And sure. it's, oh, it's just the spirit of a little kid. It's never the spirit of a little kid. You can't trust the demon. And you always got to be, be wary. Oh, sure, I understand. Um, so it could have been the demon just pretending just to let, you know, have George C. Scott let his guard down for a minute so that she could get those shears out and that's yeah. exactly what happened. Yeah. Throughout the film, we are shown another priest um, who is the exorcist yeah. of this We're, we're showing him like once in a scene that doesn't connect to anything else because that was a part of the reshoots. He has one scene where he's, he's nursing a bird back to life yeah. who has broken its wing. And now says the audience are saying, who's this? That was a reshoot. That's, yeah, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, the idea is that the studio saw the movie and said, there's no exorcism in this exorcist movie. Uh, uh, have the ending of the movie be a big exorcist sequence. Give, give people what they expect from a sequel to The Exorcist. So yeah, they had to establish an exorcist just by having a random scene with him that doesn't connect to anything else. And then he shows up again at the end. Uh, but I, I like those reshoots. I, well, the, the, the lead up to it was pretty badass, where after the, after the you know, the whatchamacallit, the shears ha scene happens, mm -hmm. then it goes <laughs> and the door opens and here comes the priest in all of this like full garb and yeah. it's like and then uh, Father Karras he's in the form of Father Karras opens his eyes and he's got the Darth Sidious eyes <laughs> the, the, the exorcist eyes ah, yeah. you've come to do battle and it's like yes. it's it's weird though it's it clunky it doesn't match the rest of the film but well, not, I'm not just okay tonally but also the fact that like does this priest know what's happening like, well I know it, it's so disconnected I was gonna say that uh, there, there needed to be a scene then where George C. Scott just drove to the church, kicked the door down, and just said, "We've ha we have a big fucking problem, and yeah. I know where it is." It would Let's still be go. awkward, but at least it would be that connecting scene. Yeah, yeah, the movie yes. doesn't Oh have. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, one or two scenes setting that up, and then him kicking the door down to the church, <laughs> saying, "You, you, you, let's go." <laughs> I'm assembling a team. I'm assembling a team. <laughs> We need 16 priests, every priest in, the, in, the, in the, the, the whole metropolitan area, as many priests as we can fit in that room. <laughs> um, let's go, you know. That would be okay Yo, for this on. movie, but the whole idea 
uh, with the original movie and just in general is that exorcisms, you, you know, you have to get approval from the Catholic Church. Oh, sure. It's a long, like, methodical process. I, I know that. So, that's a thing, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, this is an extreme circumstance. Oh, sure. But but who, did that guy, that priest get approval? No, he just shows up. He, he just showed up. He's so a rogue in, priest. In the context of this, you know, it would have been fine. It's acceptable uh, because it gets us to an awesome ending and an awesome George C. Scott monologue. Right. But that's where the movie yeah, gets visual and it's kind of, it almost feels like William Peter Blatty being like, okay, this is what you want for the end of the movie. Here you go. Because it gets really ridiculous and really violent in a way the rest of the movie isn't, where that priest is stuck to the ceiling and like his skin is peeling yeah. off, and yeah, all these crazy visual oh, snakes some, coming out yeah. of the ground. Yeah, all the all the people coming up yeah. from the floor. I mean, it's still creepy. Like it's still cool. Oh yeah, it's still um, well done. Yeah, it's not like one of those awkward shoehorns endings, like a studio reshoot ending right. that feels completely. It's the it's a rare occasion where I would agree with the studio because I watched the director's cut and the ending. I mean, he comes in and he just shoots him. Well, that's what I wanted to mention is the uh, the original ending to this movie is so anticlimactic because mm -hmm. I had heard about for years, you know, oh the studio changed the ending and blah blah blah, and it was like this almost mythical thing that no one thought they'd ever see because they didn't think it existed. And then just a couple years ago, after hearing about it for so long, they found a VHS of like the work print. Uh, and so they put that out on Blu-ray. And then when it got to that ending and it's just this flat shot. <laughs> George C. Scott walks in and shoots him and leaves. And I just started laughing out loud. <laughs> Probably 20 years of buildup of me waiting to see the original cut of this movie. And it's just that. Maybe in the original book that works in a novel form, something yeah, that simple works. Yeah, I was going to say but, that. But different... for a movie, a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, and, and it also solidifies George C. Scott's kind of worldview and his point of view with the, his yeah yelling about, I believe in filth and I believe in infidelity and all that stuff is great. I believe in death. I believe in disease and in humanity and torture and anger and hate. Yeah, that, that is definitely an improvement. Um, well, it feels like a final outlet, like for him who's been so frustrated yeah. and angry the whole movie to just vent. I believe! It feels like a completed arc. Yeah. Um, and, and in reality, yeah, just taking a gun and shooting the person that's possessed probably would be effective <laughs> in terms of, you know, an exorcism. Sure. sure. I would imagine. Um, but yeah, in a, in a filmic sense, it's not very exciting. Right. And even though this goes a little over the top, it's almost like, it's almost deserved. It's almost earned from watching the whole film. Yeah. Because it's, it's a very slow moving movie and it's very tense and atmospheric and finally you get to that ending and, and it's kind of like, like a reward almost, even though I, I, I would have loved it even if he just shot him at the end. Um, it's still, you know, that demon is just like, okay, you wanna, you wanna fight? Let's fight, Here, here's, here's all these things I can do. And then that m wonderful little moment when the other priest who survived getting his skin peeled off <laughs> and falling to the floor, he's like, you know, fight it, Karis, Father yeah. Karis, fight it. And then he's able to break through lessen the demon's powers for just a second. Bill, now! Shoot now! Kill me now! That, that moment, especially, uh, this is another reason I'm glad they did the reshoots and got Jason Miller involved, because that moment, like, because I, I love that character in the first movie, and knowing that he's kind of been, his, his body has been tormented by the spirit for the last 15 years, and that connection between these mm -hmm. two, who a relationship was established in the first Exorcist. Like, it gives me chills every time I watch it. But one thing we have to mention that we haven't yet, oh, yeah. it's very, very important, is the dream sequence in the film. Right. The, 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 the very weird dream sequence where we get uh, a bunch of, it's a, it's a, a, a star-studded affair with Patrick Ewing and Fabio. Did you notice Sam Jackson was in that scene? No. You may not have noticed it because his voice is dubbed over. Come in, please. The living are deaf. 
I'm so sorry you were murdered, Thomas. I miss you. I miss you too. It's part dream, part connection, mm -hmm. because um, spiritual connection, because he then sees Father Dyer there. Yeah, and it's so it's so surreal too how it's like the the little boy that's been murdered comes yeah. up to George C. E. Scott and he's like, "I'm sorry, you were murdered." Yeah. And it's yeah. like it's so off-putting. Yeah, they didn't even add a soft uh, filter to it. Mm -mm, no, they could have they could have overexposed it and had it glow and <laughs> soften everything. And nope. Yeah, there's Fabio. <laughs> Uh, there's a kid who got murdered. Yeah. He, it, you know, it's questionable if it's a premonition or if, you know, it's some kind of dream state that he didn't come in contact with the spirit. Yeah. Um, that, that little hint, I love that too, like, because that character is so grounded and real and focused on, like, a real world, you know, police work to have, have that one kind of brief connection to something spiritual just for that moment. Mm hmm. Uh, I can't recommend this movie enough. I don't, I, and it's something to me that like holds up. Yeah, it's it's a movie that I think now people are starting to talk about it more. Like this movie is underappreciated, so yeah. I think people are starting to come around to it. Yeah, but it has that that uh, uh, stigma of being an Exorcist sequel because right. all the other ones suck. So there's not like a string of of home video releases made by uh, Full Moon Entertainment. <laughs> No, 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 no. Exorcist 5, Exorcist 6, Exorcist no. 7. It's but... not like the Hellraiser series. Oh, okay. No. Are you my son? I'd be very proud to believe so. You're not my son. That's uh, Exorcist 3. Yeah. It, it works as a standalone movie. Uh, I think it works a little bit better if you have a connection to the first movie. Yeah, I, I, I don't really feel the connection with the original film because I, I've seen it so few times and I don't remember too much about it. Yeah, well there is a disconnect in that like the Kinderman character is played by a different actor yeah. in both movies. So I would say it completely works as a standalone film just based on that this this concept. Even, even watching it after my fifth time, I was still creeped out. Yeah, so yeah it just it creates little, that atmosphere. Great little cutaways of things. Yeah make you creeped out. Mm -hmm. I used to say for the longest time, if it wasn't because I'd always heard that the ending was reshot by the studio, and so I always said, like, if it wasn't for that reshot ending where things get a little overdone, I would probably like it as much as the original Exorcist. But then I saw the original cut of the movie, and I said, oh, I guess not. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same ending, just the it's now beefed up for the yeah the studio version and and that that I think is is helpful. I think I think it's beneficial. This is a case of studios of a studio tampering with a movie yeah. uh, to the benefit of the film. And you had some interesting trivia that Sam Jackson was in that scene. Yeah. And that there was a Larry King cameo. I have an interesting fact. Oh. You know you know the bird in the in the box. Oh the, yeah. The, in the reshot. Yeah. The bit, the, yeah. the the priest was repairing his wing. Yeah. Same bird that flew into Fabio's face on that roller coaster. It was mad at Fabio for appearing in The Exorcist 3. <laughs>